But I have to say, he has some brass neck standing up in this house telling this government how to behave after the years of his party's maladministration over the last 14 years. And might I just politely point out that he might be getting slightly ahead of himself. The Chancellor has not set out the detail of the fiscal rules in advance of the budget because she will do it to this house at the budget on Wednesday, and I encourage him to wait for that information. Uh, and could I just lastly suggest, in response to his question, that he painted a picture of the country performing so well under his party's leadership. He might want to reflect why he lost the last election so badly. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, I did wonder whether the Chancellor's announcement of changes to the fiscal rules would survive the weekend, given the five <laughs> fictitious freeports that came and then went. It's a cautionary tale of the uncertainty and confusion that can be created when policy is not announced in the proper way in yeah. Parliament. Yeah. I welcome the delayed statement by the Chief Secretary, and I'm grateful for the advance sight of it. Madam Deputy Speaker, making a £50 billion announcement at a conference overseas and not at a fiscal event in this House has understandably and notably moved markets, adding further uncertainty to an already nervous business community. Although the Chancellor announced change last week, she didn't provide any details on what that change would be. This is a common approach by Labour. That is now, becoming, now, now coming back to bite them as the realities of government set in. The Prime Minister has admitted as much in recent days, speaking of the need to embrace fiscal reality by adopting measures which, which were never listed in Labour's manifesto. Never listed. In fact, the Chancellor explicitly said before the election that she would not change the fiscal rules because, in her words, this would be fiddling the figures. By going ahead with this latest U-turn and broken promise, the Chancellor's compromised trust and credibility ahead of her very first budget. This joins a long list of broken promises already by this Labour government in such a short period of time. The promise to cut energy bills by £300, broken. The promise that their manifesto was fully costed, broken. The promise to be on the side of pensioners so obviously broken. And we know their promise not to raise taxes on working people is about to be broken too. Try as they might to sell a different story, just like government bonds right now, people ain't buying it. Because we are left in the ludicrous position where the UK, the sixth largest economy in the world, doesn't have an operative definition of public debt. But I have to say, he has some brass neck standing up in this house telling this government how to behave after the years of his party's maladministration over the last 14 years. And might I just politely point out that he might be getting slightly ahead of himself. The Chancellor has not set out the detail of the fiscal rules in advance of the budget because she will do it to this house at the budget on Wednesday, and I encourage him to wait for that information. Uh, and could I just lastly suggest, in response to his question, that he painted a picture of the country performing so well under his party's leadership. He might want to reflect why he lost the last election so badly. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, before the election, the Chancellor said that she wouldn't change the measure of debt in order to borrow more, but now she's talking about doing exactly that. Before the election, she said she wouldn't increase national insurance. Now she's talking about doing exactly that. Before the election, they steered people away from the idea they'd cut the winter fuel payment. Now they've already done exactly that. They said before the election they wouldn't increase taxes on working people. Now they're planning to do exactly that. Yep. Does the minister understand why so many of my constituents feel like they were misled? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the Honourable Member's constituents will note at the Budget on Wednesday that this party is a party that honours its, honours its promises, the promises set out in its manifesto to protect working people. And again, he may want to reflect about his own party failing his own constituents at the last election and reflect on that before trying to lecture this government. Clive Betts. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Can I welcome measures that allow for more long-term investment to improve our economic performance and our public services. Could I ask my, my right honourable friend just two aspects, if you could define them? Uh, in terms of those areas where more investment might be allowed, is housing one of them to help us uh, achieve uh, our uh, target of one and a half million homes in this Parliament? And secondly, will he ensure that wherever there is public investment, we try and make uh, that investment um, th th produce orders for UK companies rather than many of the orders going abroad. That's the way it should create real growth in our economy. Darren Jones. 
Um, I thank him for his question. As he knows, we made a commitment to deliver 1.5 million homes, and we will do just that. In terms of the second part of his question, the whole purpose of the national infrastructure strategy and then the overlapping multi-year spending reviews is to give investors and suppliers the confidence that when the government says something will be delivered, that it will be delivered. They can invest and plan on that basis to help improve the British economy. And quite frankly, they're starting from a position of complete dismay because of the failed promises of the last government. We will rectify that. Madam Deputy Speaker, and I might add that there appears to be some confusion on the benches opposite when talking about their track record and the records they have broken between the nominal and the real. So on the point of realism, will the Minister agree that, that if they are being realistic, if we are being realistic about our, our reform to the fiscal rules, unlike the last government, we, we must provide that realism and that stability and, and ensure that those wild unfunded commitments such as that abolition of, uh, of national insurance don't occur. Sharon Jones. I thank my honourable friend for his question. He points quite rightly to the £22 billion black hole that we're having to clear up from the party opposite. And at the budget on Wednesday, the Chancellor will set out how we are resetting public finances and fixing the foundation so that we can get on and deliver our manifesto. To Madam Deputy Speaker, and may I commend the, uh, the right honourable uh, gentleman for his work on stability and investment. Would he like to say a little bit more about the challenging inheritance he's received from the last government and quite how dreadful that actually has been? Darren Jones. <laughs> I welcome the honourable gentleman's question, and I know members on the opposite side find this uncomfortable, but it is a matter of fact uh, that we will return to time and time again, because the sheer truth of it is that the last government promised the British people promise after promise after promise, knowing that they did not have the money to pay for the bills. It's shameful, and the sooner they come to this House and apologise for their behaviour, it might be better for them in the long run. If the Minister is so confident in his fiscal rules, will he take this opportunity to uh, commit to the House that the 10-year uh, um, uh, guilt yield uh, in this Parliament uh, will, not re will not exceed the maximum it was over the last 10 years? Minister. The Honourable Gentleman is trying to be clever, but is actually inviting me, inviting me to speculate on the budget. He'll have to wait until Wednesday. Does the Minister agree that sustainable growth cannot come from short-termism and that falls in public sector investment planned under the last Government would have exacerbated rather than ameliorated the economic chaos that they got us into? Minister. My honourable friend is right. We have a choice at this budget to either continue with the failed policies of the last government or to change them. The British people will not be surprised that our decision is to change them, uh, reflecting on the fact that the cut in investment under the last government has led to this poor productivity in public services and a lack of growth in the economy. That serves nobody. Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's good to hear changing to change the big problem with our macroeconomic framework, the bias against new investment spending. But can I draw the Chief Secretary's attention to the other problem with the system, which is that it, treats, it gives an incentive to ministers not to well manage the assets they already hold. And I draw his attention to the 2017 sale of £3.5 billion worth of student loans for just £1.7 billion. So when it comes to financial assets, will he reassure the House that changes he is making will ensure we get value for money for the existing financial assets we hold? Yeah. I thank my honourable friend for his question. I can give him those reassurances and also point to the Office of Value for Money, which uh, will be doing work for us to ensure that we can improve on uh, behaviours of the past, but also to point more, point more broadly to the way in which we do manage our current assets. And people only have to look at the state of our prisons, our hospitals, our schools, with rack and roofs falling in to know that after 14 years of cuts to investment, we can't carry on like that. That's why people voted for change at the last election and why we will deliver it. 